20 years ago, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 was not only a major box office hit, but it proved this superhero movie thing wasn't a passing fad. Filmmakers with vision could do something with comic book IP that was more than camp, more than hokum, could treat the characters intelligently and with dignity while also offering a supremely exciting and fun adventure. It's basically a perfect Spider-Man movie. Pizza time. And then for the next two decades, Sony has been trying to hold on to the rights to Spider-Man with an iron grip so tight that anything halfway interesting gets squeezed out. Instead, Sony simply hopes for a quick enough cash grab that Marvel doesn't take back Spidey and his myriad villains en masse. It seems wildly improbable in 2024, but Marvel used to be in pretty dire straits as a company, who was on the verge of bankruptcy by the early 1990s. As a result, they started to sell off movie rights to various studios for what seems like pittance today. In 1994, Marvel licensed the X-Men and all related characters to 20th Century Fox for a measly $2.6 million. Adjusting for inflation, that's still a little over $5.5 million. The resultant film in 2000 cost the studio $75 million, but raked in $236 million worldwide, a huge, huge return on investment. In 99, Sony bought the rights to Spider-Man and all his amazing friends and enemies for $7 million. Spidey was a much more bankable name to the film industry than the X-Men, hence the higher price tag. But my God, was it worth it for them. And for us. With Sam Raimi at the helm and a budget of $139 million, the first Spider-Man in 2002 was a phenomenal hit. $825 million worldwide. Over a billion today's money. That means billion. Not just a moneymaker, but a critical darling too, owing to the seriousness with which Raimi treated the characters while still retaining the more fantastical comic booky elements. Yes, it's not the most polished of comic book movies by today's standards, but Tobey Maguire was a winning Peter Parker, and his journey to learn that great power and responsibility are a package deal still rings true. One could argue Stan Lee and Steve Ditko made the perfect superhero origin, which the movie deftly portrays. Not to mention Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn, a villain so perfectly cast it's a wonder he even needed a mask. <laughs> The first Spider-Man came out the year I graduated high school and it absolutely blew me away. Finally, Spider-Man the way I always envisioned him on the big screen. I never really liked the suit, if I'm honest, but hey, beggars and choosers. May God be with you. After the success of Spider-Man, the floodgates opened wide. The next several years saw Marvel movies galore. Daredevil, X2, and Hulk in 2003, The Punisher, and Blade Trinity in 2004. Oh yeah, Blade. So the first Blade came out in 1998, predating X-Men and Spider-Man 1. Blade 2 even came out the same year as Spider-Man 1. The first two movies are good and made money, but they weren't the juggernauts of the other two franchises. Probably because mainstream audiences don't know who the f Blade is. You obviously do not know who you are f***ing with. Blade Trinity sucked. And though it made a decent amount of money, the shine had worn off of that particular franchise. In 2004, Sony followed up their success with Spider-Man 2. And I truly cannot overstate what a high watermark this movie is. Directly adapting the famous story Spider-Man No More, bridging issues 50 through 52 of The Amazing Spider-Man from 1967. One of the most important stories of the Stan Lee and John Romita Sr. pairing, it depicts Peter Parker giving up the mantle of Spider-Man, fed up with the lack of respect he gets from the city, despite all the good he does and the pummeling he takes. The movie also brought in elements of Dr. Octopus's first appearance, as well as the 1966 story, If This Be My Destiny. Raimi and screenwriter Alvin Sargent sifted through several drafts by several other writers to a eventually hone in on a story that is, at heart, about Peter choosing once again to forego his superhero life in favor of a normal one, only to realize he needs to be greatly responsible once he gets his great powers again. Spider-Man 2 has a better story, better and more nuanced villain in Alfred Molina's Doc Ock, another terrific turn from Maguire and Kirsten Dunst, and even allowed Raimi to cut loose with his evil deadness a few times, specifically in the masterful scene when Doc Ock's robotic arms gain sentience. <laughs> Somehow, unbelievably, I checked the numbers, Spider-Man 2 made less money than its predecessor, with just $795 million. I'm saying that like that's not still an incredible amount of money. Spider-Man 2, from my memory, simply blew the first movie, which I still liked, out of the water. Even moments that should give me cringe chills, Specifically, I'm talking about the moment on the L train when the people of New York City defend Spider-Man and keep his identity a secret, worked and even brought a tear to my eye. You wanna get to him, you gotta go through me. And I grew up in Denver. We never talked to anyone. 
Well, then three years later, we got Spider-Man 3. To say this production was fraught might be an understatement. Raimi wanted to conclude Harry Osborn's arc from the first two movies, and he wanted a villain to showcase that all of Peter's heroism isn't uniformly good. So for that, he chose Sandman, a character whom Spider-Man directly created. All of that was both well and good, but Raimi also wanted another big villain to go along with Sandman. Raimi pitched the Vulture as the secondary villain, but Sony wanted a sure thing. They wanted a big popular villain who could hit with the youngos. They wanted Venom, a character only created in the 90s, but who had already rose to prominence. You know him, the big goo guy. Thank you. Sony, of course, got their wish, and the result in Spider-Man 3 was, if you ask me, a mess. Why was it a mess? It still had Raimi directing, all the main cast returning, loads of action, and increasingly good CGI. It's a mess because it's clear Venom is at odds with what Raimi wanted to do. The black suit arc, which predated Venom in the comics, needed to be adapted, which gave us the now infamous emo Peter stuff. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. And there just wasn't enough time to flesh that out properly while still trying to do the Sandman Peter's Fault stuff or the Harry Osborn Green Goblin 2 stuff. And by the time we actually see proper Venom toward the end of the movie, he's not the massive threat nor the lethal protector that fans wanted. I know people like it more now, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm saying at the time it felt like Batman and Robin syndrome. What killed the dinosaurs? Yes, age. Despite the movie still making loads of money, close to $900 million, Sony would let the franchise lie fallow for a few years and ultimately reboot it rather than continue with Sam Raimi. Let me tell you a quick story about film rights of other Marvel Comics properties. In the mid-80s, New World Pictures, the company started by the late great Roger Corman, bought Marvel Entertainment Group, which included Marvel Comics and Marvel Productions outright. Only a few years later, in 1989, New World sold Marvel Entertainment Group to a holdings company, but they retained Marvel Productions and folded it into their TV and film wing. They're the ones basically who made all the cartoons that we loved in the 90s. The 90s were, as previously stated, a time of upheaval at Marvel, with them acquiring part of Toy Biz and later Malibu and Panini before the comic book bubble burst and they had to file for bankruptcy in 1995. This is when Marvel started selling off rights and whatnot. However, years earlier in the mid 80s, a German producer met with Stan Lee about obtaining the rights to make a Fantastic Four movie. Constantine Films ended up buying these rights for a measly $250,000, but hadn't done anything with them. Rights to things can lapse, and so they needed to make something quickly in order to hold on to the first family of science. In early 92, Constantine partnered with the aforementioned Roger Corman and his New Horizons pictures to produce the film for $1 million. Okay, what's the budget? And he said, $30 million. And I said, how much money do you have? One million dollars. They cast the movie and began production in late 1992 in and around Venice, California. The shoot lasted only between three and three and a half weeks. Now this is a cheap movie, but it was still a movie with actors who thought they would eventually see it on the big screen. Initially, the film was supposed to come out Labor Day 1993, then was pushed to January 1994, but even so, the cast went to Comic-Con to promote it. But they were all of them deceived. The movie, as is now common knowledge, was never going to come out. It's what is called an ash can copy, a movie made entirely to retain the rights to a property. When Fox went to Marvel to buy the rights to X-Men, they also discussed Fantastic Four, but because Constantine made that spurious Fantastic Four movie, Marvel had to buy the rights from them to then sell it to Fox. And you can bet Ben Grimm's craggy granite keister it cost more than 250,000 plus $1 million. What kind of a thing have I turned into? Constantine got a big fat payday for essentially tossing money at a bootleg people pass around for a laugh. Only 10 years after the first Spider-Man movie and five years after the third movie, Sony rebooted the franchise. They got hot young actors Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone to play Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy and a supporting cast full of notable character actors. The Amazing Spider-Man had a lot going for it, but what it doesn't have is much to say. Garfield's Peter is a smarmy pretty boy rather than an overworked nerd, and when he's Spider-Man, he gives us some of the patented Spidey snark. The rest of the time, he comes across more like tortured teen genius than friendly neighborhood anybody. But even changing the love interest to Gwen Stacy, who had a very silly arc in Spider-Man 3 I didn't even talk about. <laughs> the Amazing Spider-Man, or TASM as I will now call it, 
just doesn't have its own identity. We still have to see Peter gain powers and try to master them. The villain is another scientist with ties to Peter. We still have to watch Uncle Ben die. And then we even have to watch Captain Stacy die. A major event from the comics that comes, oh, only roughly about 100 issues into Spider-Man's tenure. This goddamn movie loves killing parents because the overarching mystery of the film is who actually killed Peter's scientist parents. It's just so joyless and perfunctory. It's not badly made, but right down to the New Yorkers sticking up for Spider-Man, it doesn't do anything better or even all that different than the Raimi movies. And I know people like Garfield, but he's just so f***ing sad all the time. This isn't Spider-Man Chester by the Sea, but despite my general distaste for Tasm, it made a decent amount of money. Still less than any of the Raimi movies, even though it cost way more, but the move paid off. Sony had proven, at a time when the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Avengers were the biggest things in the world, they could also make a movie based on a character they own the rights to still. As much as Tasm was a snooze, Tasm 2 in 2014 was, well, it's not boring. The tone is much lighter, for a lot of the runtime anyway, and it has more color. And finally, we got a Spider-Man costume on screen I liked, so that is actually something. But who doggies is this movie a mess? It's not an unenjoyable mess, but it is a mess. They decided to do the death of Gwen Stacy at the hands of Green Goblin only two movies into the new continuity, but flipped it so it's Harry Osborn who just shows up in this movie to go full gobby by the end rather than Norman. The film also bestowed upon us Jamie Foxx as Electro, or I should say, a version of Electro who hardly resembles any version of Electro, but does resemble an offensive nerd stereotype. And for no real reason, Paul Giamatti is Rhino for two minutes. <laughs> Actually, let me correct that. For what at first seemed like no real reason. Because by the end of the movie, it becomes clear. A mysterious figure seems to be putting together a team of incredible individuals. No, it's not Nick Fury and it's not the Avengers. You see, Sony has the rights to Spider-Man and all his many related characters. But as happens with Batman and other similar solo heroes, most of the many related characters, at least the ones with name and gimmick recognition, are the villains. Sony wanted to make their own version of the Avengers, but with Spider-Man villains rather than heroes. The Sinister Six. And this was the crux of what's been going on ever since. When it comes to British film and TV rights, even if a writer is commissioned to write a piece of work for hire, any character or idea they create fully on their own is theirs rather than owned by the program or the network. Pretty great deal if you can get it. And so in 1963, when the BBC was trying to launch their new series, Doctor Who, and yes, I am gonna talk about it again, they commissioned a writer named Terry Nation to write a sci-fi serial. As only the second serial of the show, no one expected it was going to be as popular as it was. And so when he penned the seven episodes that introduced the Daleks, who could have guessed they'd create a mania? A Dalek mania. Now, one could argue, and I will, that BBC designer Raymond Cusick, who created the iconic design of the Daleks, is more integral to the lasting success of the aliens. The eye stalk, the weird suction cup arm, the tank-like movement apparatus, they're as indelible and singular as any sci-fi creations in the television age. But that's not how it works, and it's Nation who gets to be called the creator of the Daleks and who retained the rights to them. So naturally, what's a guy to do when he's making money off merchandise and benefiting from the UK public's love of the Daleks? He tried to spin them off. There were Dalek-centric comic strips and feature films based on his, at the time, two produced Dalek scripts featuring Peter Cushing as, a, as just a guy named Doctor Who that travels through time and space. Nation even attempted a few times to create a Dalek-centric television series both in the UK and in the US, hoping the Daleks alone could carry a series and break the American market before even Doctor Who aired there. And here's what happened. He couldn't. People who love the Daleks, almost categorically, love them as the antagonist of Doctor Who. They like the Daleks as a function of fighting against the Doctor. They are, no question, an integral and important part of Doctor Who, but without the Doctor, people lose interest in the Daleks pretty quickly. Why? Because they're evil! People want to root for heroes, or at least anti-heroes, not space fascists. Also, they just kind of say the one thing over and over and over again. Exterminate! 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 And so, try as he might, and he still made a mint off of them, Terry Nation could never quite get the Daleks, which he owned the rights to, to work outside the series he did not. With Marvel Studios now fully ensconced at Disney and their total box office gross greater than the GDP of most nations, the MCU seemed unstoppable, going from strength to strength. And with every hit, fans got more and more annoyed that some other of their favorite Marvel characters couldn't show up due to licensing the biggest villain of all. 
Now I'm not going to get into various email hacks and dumb things studio heads say when they think no one is looking, but in 2014 it came out that Marvel's Kevin Feige had approached Sony's Amy Pascal about using Spider-Man in an MCU movie. While it seemed like these discussions broke down, by 2015 a deal was in place to include Peter Parker in an upcoming film. That movie, of course, ended up being 2016's Captain America Civil War, which brought together a million and one Marvel characters and introduced not only Tom Holland as Spider-Man, but Chadwick Boseman as Black Panther. Big, important movie for the franchise. That Spider-Man appearance was incredibly well-received, and Sony and Marvel eventually made yet another deal for movies, including solo Spider-Man movies within the MCU, as well as appearances in big team-up movies. Between 2016 and 2019, Tom Holland's Spider-Man appeared in... Civil War, Spider-Man Homecoming, Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame, and Spider-Man Far From Home. Five movies in three years. Both the actor and the portrayal proved incredibly popular with fans and audiences. And money? Oh yes, it made f***ing loads of it. Sony makes money on these movies naturally, since they are licensing the character back to Marvel for use in the movies. But while Sony can and does make Spider-Man animated films featuring Peter Parker and Spider-Man, they could not produce their own solo movies with Tom Holland's Spider-Man until that agreement is done. There was even a brief period in which it looked like Marvel and Sony weren't going to reach another agreement for a third Spider-Man movie, and Holland might be out of the MCU as a result. That didn't end up happening, and of course, Spider-Man No Way Home hit our screens in 2021. You might remember that multiverses were big shit at the time, and that movie capitalized on the shared love of these characters with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield appearing in the MCU as other universes Spider-Mans. The villains of the film were entirely the roster of baddies from the earlier Sony films. Willem Dafoe got to play Green Goblin using only his own terrifying face, which was great and Doc Ock, Sandman, a normal Electro, and the Lizard all showed up as well. Hell, J.K. Simmons even came back as some version of J. Jonah Jameson. What this meant for fans was huge amounts of fun. What it meant for Marvel Studios is co-opting the nostalgia of the previous filmic Spider-Man incarnations into the MCU alongside their own. But what this meant for Sony is that even their own Spider-Man characters were now part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Even if they had wanted to do Spider-Man 4 or The Amazing Spider-Man 3, Marvel Studios kind of did it first. So what do you do if you're Sony? And before we get too much further into this, I am not over here caping for Sony, nor pitying a company making billions of dollars. Far from it. But I can see how up creek they are when it comes to Spider-Man. They can make villain movies, and villain movies that, for now, can't or at least don't have Spider-Man in them. But the best villains are reactions to the hero, and Spider-Man has among the best rogues galleries in all of comics. In 2018, lucky for them, Sony made Venom. <laughs> Venom is a weird movie. It shouldn't work even a little tiny bit at all, and it's definitely supremely early 2000s in tone and storytelling, but Tom Hardy's twitchy performance plus fans finally getting a cinematic version of Venom that looked like the Venom from the comics was enough. The public showed up for this thing. Venom cost half of what either TASM movie cost, but made way more. It nearly made what Spider-Man Homecoming made. Is this evidence people will go see Spider-Man villain movies? No, it was evidence people would go see a Venom movie. V-E-N-O-M, Venom. For the next movie, they added Carnage, another Spider-Man villain that people like for some reason. And yes, Venom Let There Be Carnage came out in 2021, still amid the pandemic, but it made considerably less than the first movie, while Spider-Man No Way Home was out there making almost two billion just a couple months later. God, sorry. God, I'm so sorry. And it only gets worse from here. <laughs> Did you think it'd get better? It doesn't. 2022 saw the release of Morbius, a movie so aggressively self-serious, it actually adds to the stupidity. While Venom got on by janky charm, Morbius tried to convince us no jank existed. No jank here. Morbius, you know, the living vampire, first appeared in a Spider-Man comic and ergo is technically a Spider-Man character, but he doesn't need Spider-Man. If any character has a chance to do a blade and be his own guy, it's Morbius. But only if you don't make a movie that sucks hose water. Not even a meme-led It's Morbin Time push could make people want to see the movie, and it only made $167 million, which is less than the production budget of Spider-Man No Way Home. The future of the Sony Spider-Man universe didn't look much brighter. A Craven the Hunter movie was in production but kept getting pushed. First expected in January, ugh, 2023. It then moved to October 2023, and then all the way to August 2024, and now, at least for now, November 2024. 
The previously announced Silver and Black, which would have featured Silver Sable and Black Cat, got permanently shelved. Because why make a movie about two female superhero characters people actually know and like when you can make... I can see you. Okay, so now I have to talk about Madam Web. We all know how incoherent and stupid the movie is. We know how it was clearly cut to ribbons and hashed together with ADR and gauze. And we also know how nobody told Sony that Dakota Johnson is actually an agent of chaos using weaponized limes to take Hollywood down from the inside. Actually, no, that's not the truth, Ellen. You were invited. But even knowing all that, it's astounding how little money Madam Web made. It cost around a hundred million and it made a hundred million. That budget, of course, doesn't account for marketing, so both Madam Web and Morbius have lost so much money. It isn't merely that these movies are bad, it's that they seem to be made using a book called How to Make Superhero Movies, written after Supergirl came out. Remember that one? The worst movie ever? You've had your fun, Selena. The game is finished. Hardly. They seem only to exist to check a box, and they can't even be called a blatant cash grab at this point because they're losing so much money. At this point, I think Sony has had enough and is actively trolling us. Did you all see the trailer for Venom The Last Dance? It's ostensibly the last of the Venom movies, but it hasn't escaped us that they've cast Reese Evans as someone, despite him being Dr. Kurt Connors in The Amazing Spider-Man, Chiwetel Ejiofor as some kind of military guy, despite him being Baron Mordo in the Doctor Strange movies, and Cristo Fernandez as the bartender who witnesses Eddie Brock disappear and finds a dollop of Venom goo, despite that taking place in a different universe. Sony needs to make Spider-Man related movies to retain the rights, but they cannot make a movie with Spider-Man directly in it because they don't want to be in direct competition with, essentially, themselves. So they have these villains and have tried time and again to make a shared cinematic universe with them all, even though it makes no sense for any of them to know each other. Originally, it seemed like Morbius was going to take place in the Maguire universe, but that got changed. And Vulture from Homecoming ended up in the Morbius universe. And Madam Web was maybe going to take place in the Andrew Garfield universe, but that got scrapped. And Venom has never definitively taken place in any universe, but now can apparently hop between the MCU whenever he wants to. It's somehow an even less coherent and unified continuity than the waning days of the DCEU, which changed creative directions like eight times. Sony's Spider-Man universe has never even had one creative direction beyond keeping the rights and using villains to do so. Spider-Man is Sony's cash cow, but he's also its albatross. They have a cinematic universe without a focal point, a franchise without a flagship character, and a roster of villains who have to become anti-heroes to even stand a chance. It's a waiting for Godot situation, but with Morbius and, I don't know, Scorpion loitering on the side of the road, waiting for Spider-Man to show up. I keep thinking about the Joker movie. I personally have no interest in the Joker without Batman, but at the very least, you can say they did something different with the idea that didn't require Batman to be around. If Sony wanted to make interesting movies with their roster of Spider-Man villains, they should take a conceptual swing like that. Give them a twist that sets them apart, make it so they're compelling even without the incredibly popular good guy. But even as great as Spider-Man villains are, none of them except Venom has the cultural cachet of someone like the Joker. It's like Sony keeps trying to hint that maybe sometime soon, Spider-Man will show up in one of these movies if we just go see them in the meantime. It's a very tough trick to pull off, especially when we've had good Spider-Man movies very recently. The audience seems to be speaking with their not wallets. So what's the answer? People want Spider-Man. You, Sony, have the rights to Spider-Man. But if you put Spider-Man in a movie right now, you run the risk of confusing the market. You also own Spider-Man's massive roster of villains, but who will they fight against if not Spider-Man? And you're running out of villains who can possibly fit the anti-hero mold. Are you gonna do a Tombstone or Hydro Man solo movie? At what point is the amount of money lost on these bombs greater than the amount you stand to gain from potential Spider-Man MCU movies? Or is the hope of recapturing the success you saw 20 years ago always going to send your spider senses tingling? Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments. Would you watch an Alistair Smythe solo movie? Remember him? Damn, did I just give Sony an idea? Shit. Well, until then, keep it glued to Nerdist.com. Money!